Okay, folks. Welcome on a sunny day. Sunny day. Um, we have a class next week as well. <coughs> Our own students are off, so uh, for the next two weeks. But we we have a class to uh, fill the gap from the fourth of March. So next week we'll be looking at the monarchy. And if you want to do any homework on that, um, probably Deuteronomy 17, First uh, Samuel 8 to 17. Preparations for Saul coming as first king and uh, David taking over from him. And Second Samuel chapter 7. Uh, I'm sure we'll touch on these not other places as well. Okay, uh, today we're looking at uh, Joshua and Judges. Let's commit our time to the Lord. <coughs> our Heavenly Father, we bless you that you are the uh, covenant God, that you are the promise-giving, promise-making, and promise-keeping God. And we would ask that uh, we might know you in that way afresh today, for you have promised that where even just two or three are gathered in your name, you are there. And we crave uh, your presence above everything else, Father, <coughs> through your Spirit, come to us. And uh, through your Spirit, open up our minds and hearts to give that enlightenment that only you can give as you lead us into the truth of your word. Bless to us our uh, attention to your word, our reading of your word today, our uh, meditation upon that word, and we ask that uh, for each of us you would have uh, a word for us, and something that we can chew on as we leave this place, and uh, as you speak to us in the coming days as well, through all of that. We ask for your blessing to be upon us through Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. <coughs> Are there uh, extra sheets? <coughs> okay, uh, today we, we move out of the Pentateuch, the first um, five books of the Bible, otherwise known as the books of Moses or uh, the Torah, uh, to... Uh, those within Judaism. I want us to cover, and we can only cover it very briefly today, uh, two of the periods of the history of Israel that are known as the conquest of Canaan and the period of the judges. And these are found respectively, of course, in the books of Joshua, the conquest of Canaan, and uh, the judges, the period of the judges. But before we get on to that, <coughs> I want you to take um, the extra handout I've given you today on the, the books of the Bible, the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And what you find here is a, a list of the books of the Bible. Some of you will have the list of the books of the Bible. You will have memorized that from your own English versions from your youngest days. Uh, it's a, a good discipline just to, to know that itself. Uh, but what you have here is the list of the books uh, of uh, the Old Testament as they're found in the Hebrew version of the Scriptures, in the Hebrew Bible, which is sometimes known as the Tanakh. And uh, from the right-hand column, uh, you'll see that uh, there are three main divisions of the Hebrew Bible. The first is, um, to use its Hebrew word, the Torah, uh, often translated as law, although a better translation would be fuller and richer translation would be teaching, uh, the fullness of the teaching that we find in the scripture. So that's, that's the first, and that's the, the first five books that we have in our Old Testament as well, the, the Torah. Uh, 
Secondly, the, the next division of the Hebrew Bible is the prophets. And you'll see it's a, uh, it takes in uh, a large section of the Old Testament. Uh, the Hebrew word for uh, that is Nevi'im. And then thirdly, you have the writings, or the Kithuvim. Uh, some of you might have come across the, the word Tanakh um, before. I don't know if you have. Um, as a name for the Hebrew Bible, Tanakh is just a made-up word. Uh, it's just a, a case of taking the initial letters from each of the three sections of the Hebrew Bible. T from Torah. N from Nevi'im and K from Kithavim and uh, fixing them together with two A sounds. So that's where you get uh, Tanakh if you've ever come across that. That's just the, the Hebrew Bible. Um, where do we get this threefold uh, division from? Well, uh, it looks as if Jesus himself was aware of this threefold division uh, within uh, the scriptures uh, with which he was familiar. And that comes out not least on, in one of his resurrection appearances uh, on the, when he encounters the two on the Emmaus Road uh, in Luke chapter 24 <coughs> and verse 24. Uh, there he says, This is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses the prophets and the Psalms. So he's got a, a threefold division, the law uh, of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And if you look at your uh, handout again, you'll see that the first book in, um, listed in the writings is in fact the Psalms. So it does look as if uh, Jesus is referring there to this threefold division of the, the Hebrew Bible. Look again at the list. Uh, can you see where the order of the books begins to diverge from the order of the books in our English versions? And nobody in my Pentateuch class is allowed to answer that one. <laughs> where is it? Uh... Sorry? Ruth. Yeah, well done. Uh, Ruth. Uh, the convergence starts after the book of uh, Judges. The, the Hebrew Bible continues on after Judges with... Uh, the books of Samuel and uh, the books of Kings, whereas our English, by English versions uh, have uh, Ruth squeezed in there between Judges and uh, Samuel. And that's probably because um, the book of Ruth begins with the words, uh, in the days when the judges ruled, or in the days when the judges judged. So it's put historically into the same, into the same place. In the Hebrew Bible, if you scan down, uh, you'll see that Ruth actually uh, is found in the third section in the, in the writings. And it's one of a group of five books uh, that are called in Hebrew the Megiloth, uh, or the scrolls in uh, translation. And uh, the reason that these books are together, or one of the reasons that they're together, is that each of them is used still today within Judaism for one or other of the great, uh, of the main festivals and feast days of the Jewish uh, religious calendar. So Ruth is associated uh, with Pentecost. Why is there a difference in the order between the books in the English Bible and the books in the Hebrew Bible? Uh, well, the, the books in our English Bibles have come to us uh, through Latin from Greek, from the Greek translation of the Hebrew uh, which has come to be known as the, the Septuagint. And the Septuagint was the, the Bible of the early church because the empire then, of course, had moved um, and Greek was the dominant language, uh, even though uh, the Greek empire had succumbed to the Roman empire and the Roman empire was coming, rising into power, but Greek remained uh, the main language of education for a long time, even within uh, the Roman empire. So uh, that's uh, something of why the order is, is a little different. But for our purposes today, we're looking at uh, Joshua and Judges. Uh, and uh, we think of Joshua and Judges, I'm sure, very much as uh, historical books. 
but actually, if you, if, if you look at uh, the Hebrew Bible, they're found within the division uh, known as the Prophets. So Joshua and Judges are books of the Prophets, in particular books of uh, the section that are known as the Former Prophets. And that's using a term that comes from uh, these verses. I think I have noted something in, in Zechariah. It's the, uh, the AV translation is Former Prophets. Uh, the NIV translation is earlier prophets, but um, pointing back to these uh, early books, Joshua, Judges, and Samuel, and Kings. So why are they called, uh, why are they part of the prophets? Well, of course, in some of these books, uh, in, even in Judges itself, you'll come across um, prophets. You come across Deborah, prophetess. And then, of course, when you get into Samuel and Kings, there are uh, lots more prophets that you read of there, not least Samuel himself, and Gad, and Nathan, and uh, Elijah, and Elisha, and uh, so on. Uh, so in some of these books there are prophetic figures, but that's not really the, the reason that they're, they're found amongst the, the prophets. Uh, the history that's recorded, the reason that they're amongst the, uh, the prophets is that the history that's recorded in these books is history that's written from a very specific point of view. It's uh, history that's written from a, a prophetic point of view or based on a prophetic assessment of that history or a theological assessment of that, that history. Uh, because um, uh, the, the, the prophets themselves were uh, servants of the covenant the very heart of the covenant was the law, uh, the law that Israel was supposed to keep. And we'll see something of this uh, later as we uh, look more closely at the first chapter of uh, Joshua. And really, uh, in all the books from Joshua through to Second Kings, uh, these former prophet, pro prophet, prophetic books, uh, Israel's history is, an assessment of it is based on were they faithful to the law, uh, to the covenant law? Did they keep the covenant law? Were they obedient to the covenant law? Or were they unfaithful and disobedient? So it's history from that point of view. Uh, so it's an assessment uh, not of um, Israel's military prowess or the foreign policies or uh, the home policies of the king or the leader or anything like that. It's an assessment of, did they keep the law? Did they keep the covenant or not? And that's why we have them uh, amongst the, the prophets. Okay, let's uh, turn then to uh, the book of Joshua. And uh, we can read just the opening section of, of this. The first, let's say the first nine verses of Joshua chapter 1. <clears throat> Let's hear God's word. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea, that's the Mediterranean Sea, on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead this people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. 
and so on. I want us to look uh, just at uh, a couple of the main themes, two or three of the main themes in the book of uh, Joshua. And one of the ways in which, uh, the way in which I want to start off doing that is, by, uh, a way I've, I think I've mentioned in the past, is by comparing and contrasting uh, the opening passage of the book uh, with uh, the closing passage of the book. Now there we've just read in these opening verses, verse 2, uh, the Lord is here addressing, Moses has died, uh, the Lord is addressing Moses' former assistant, Joshua, who has now become the leader, and uh, he commands him and his people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about uh, to give them. Uh, so they are at the very borders of the promised land, they are about to cross the Jordan River, they are about to enter into the land, um, their inheritance. Now if you compare that with the, the, the final section, let's uh, turn to chapter 24 and read uh, verses 28 to the end. Uh, so the last part of the book of Joshua, then Joshua sent the people away each to his own inheritance. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Serah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him, and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. And Joseph's bones which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And Eliezer, son of Aaron, died and was buried at Gibeah, which had been allotted to his son Phineas in the hill country of uh, Ephraim. Okay, so we learn there that uh, the Israelites buried Joshua, and Joshua was buried in the land of his inheritance. Uh, Israel, the uh, summing up of um, the history of Joshua's <coughs> rule over Israel, Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua, and his influence as a leader actually um, percolated down for some time after that and of the elders who had lived him, who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Uh, but also Joseph's bones uh, were buried in Shechem. Uh, now we'll come back to some of that, but there's a couple of, uh, couple of uh, themes in these two readings, from the beginning and end of Joshua, um, that I want us to look at. And uh, the major one is the, the theme of the land. I'm going to look at uh, some aspects of that. So the theme of the land. And the land, first of all, as um, the fulfillment of the promise of the Abrahamic covenant. Or one of the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. We've seen in some of our previous studies that the promise of land uh, was first given explicitly to Abraham. Uh, way back in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7, uh, we saw in our studies of Genesis that that promise was repeated often to Abraham and expanded upon, but also repeated to uh, the generations coming after him as well. And I've um, given you some uh, references there that you can look up. And here, uh, the Lord looks back to that. In verse 6 of Joshua chapter 1, there's a reference to this promise that God made a way back in Genesis 12. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. And that word swore uh, reminds us of uh, that episode on Mount Moriah. Uh, Genesis chapter 22, uh, when the Lord sealed the covenant promises by, uh, by, an oath, by entering into an oath there. So he took an oath, he swore an oath, and that's what's uh, remembered here. 
So here in the book of Joshua, we have the fulfillment of one of the, the, the main strands of the promises uh, lying at the heart of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, the promise of land. Uh, the other promises were, of course, uh, relationship with God. Uh, so that was, in some real sense, fulfilled at Mount Sinai. And uh, promise of de uh, posterity and descendants to a large extent fulfilled already uh, in Exodus chapter 1. Did you notice uh, in our readings how uh, I think we can say the faith uh, not only of Joshua uh, is recognized but also the faith of Jacob and Joseph from amongst the patriarchs. Uh, their faith in the promise that God had given to them of the land. Uh, how that's uh, highlighted in that uh, final section of the book in verse 30 of uh, chapter 24. They buried Joshua in the land of his inheritance. Now, one of the things that's really significant about that, of course, is that he's one of only two men of which of that generation, of his generation, about which that could be said. The other one, of course, was Caleb, who followed the Lord wholly or wholeheartedly. Um, but no one else in their generation, uh, of, of no one else in their generation can that be said. The rest of their generation died in the desert because they didn't enter into the promised land. They were fearful of entering into the promised land. None of the others believed the promise. Um, or believed the Lord, that the Lord would give them that land, regardless of how mighty and impressive the inhabitants might have appeared uh, to be. So, uh, implicitly, Joshua's faith is, is uh, recognized here. <coughs> and in verse 32 of that passage, you'll see a reference is made to Joseph's bones um, that the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, and of course they did that because um, uh, Joseph himself had prophesied that the day would come when that would happen. They would get up out uh, from the land uh, and they would be back in the promised land. And uh, Joseph had in fact directed that his bones be taken up uh, so that they would be in the promised land. Uh, so he certainly embraced uh, the promise. And his bones, we read, were buried at Shechem. Uh, you notice where they were buried in Shechem? Uh, in the uh, one of only two small portions of the promised land that belonged to the patriarchs from the time of the patriarchs. Um, this was the, um, the parcel of ground that uh, Jacob bought in Genesis chapter 33. And so... Uh, that's a kind of statement that you could almost pass over, but of course it's recognizing uh, that the faith of Jacob in buying the land was vindicated and the faith in Joseph in asking that his bones be uh, brought up to the land, that that faith was also uh, vindicated. So Jacob, I think, and Joseph, like uh, their forefather Abraham before them, we can say of them, as the writer to the Hebrews says in, in uh, chapter 11, verse 13, they were still living by faith when they died. Uh, we see that by their uh, prophecies that they made, by their actions, by their forward-looking, by their words, all bear, bearing witness to them. The writer to the Hebrews says, they did not receive the things promised, they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And of course if that was true of them in Old Testament times before there was ever word of resurrection how much more then can it be true of us who anticipate the fulfillment of all the promises of God uh, for all the nations uh, who will come at last from Abraham. The nations who come not just uh, physically from Abraham but in particular the ones who come in line with the promise to come according to faith, to come according to the Spirit. All the promises 
uh, that will find their fulfillment in what we might call the land of the new heavens and the new earth, the new creation uh, in which only righteousness uh, will dwell. So as the Lord fulfilled the promises for Abraham and his seed and for Jacob and his seed and for Joseph and his seed, so we can be sure that the Lord will fulfill all his promises for us and for our seed uh, for all generations. So that's the first thing, the, the, the fulfillment of the promise. We have a promise-keeping God, not just a promise-making God, but a promise-keeping God. Sometimes it takes a long time for those promises to be fulfilled, uh, way beyond the generation of those to whom it was first given, uh, but nevertheless, all the promises will be fulfilled. In terms of the structure of the book of uh, Joshua, the first 12 chapters deal with uh, the entrance into the land, uh, the conquest of the land. It happened in three great movements. They went in, of course, from the east, across the Jordan, into the central territory. Then they moved north uh, in a second campaign, and then they moved towards the south in a third campaign that's uh, listed for us in these opening 12 chapters of, of Joshua. And then the rest of Joshua, almost all of the rest of Joshua, is taken up with the land as well. From chapter 13 to chapter 22, it's all about the division of the land uh, for each of the tribes. And the, uh, the, the land was divided according to Lot. Uh, in other words, uh, it was all in the hands of God to choose for each tribe where they were to live. Uh, the territory that each tribe was was to receive. So the fulfillment of the promise of land in the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, the second thing I want us to notice is that uh, I think we can, we can, there are lots of suggestions that uh, seem to point in the direction that the land that they enter, uh, the promised land, is, is a kind of new uh, Eden. Um, it's described, how can I say that? Well, it's described, first of all, as a good land. A few um, references to that in chapter 23. And that, of course, is uh, a truth that's been uh, echoed or intimated from the beginning of the book of Exodus uh, and through other of the books of uh, the Pentateuch as well. But it's particularly... Uh, a truth that's highlighted in the book of Deuteronomy as Moses there preaches those five sermons on the borders of the promised land in anticipation of the people going in to the promised land. But the description of the land as being good, I think it takes us back, it's an allusion back to the opening chapter of the Bible and to the description of the land that was created on the third day uh, when... Uh, the dry ground was separated from the waters, and the Lord called the dry ground land. It's the same word, Eretz, as it's used uh, for the land of Israel or the promised land. Uh, and immediately on creating that land, um, God stood back, as he did with every one of his acts of creation, and declared his appreciation of it. Uh, this is good. So the land in Genesis, on the third day in Genesis chapter 1, the land that God created uh, at the beginning, it's described as good. And we saw that that meant it was beautiful, it was fit for purpose, it was just exactly as God intended it. So the good land that the, the Lord gives to Israel here in the book of Joshua, um, it's certainly uh, being regarded by God, therefore, as being beautiful. Uh, perhaps more, it's just what Israel needs, it's fit for Israel's purpose. Uh, but um, there's probably something of the notion um, in that reference to the good land that um, it reflects something of the goodness of creation at the very beginning. So should we think of the, this good land in some sense as pointing to a new creation? A new creation into which God is bringing his, uh, his new humanity, his new uh, covenant people. 
Certainly, in keeping with that idea is uh, the additional description of the, the land as being a place of abundance. Uh, we've come to know uh, the promised land as the land flowing with milk and honey. It's a, an expression that's coming to uh, our English language. Um, we see that phrase in chapter 5 and verse 6, uh, as we see it often right through from the, the book of uh, Exodus as well, Leviticus, Numbers, and often, very often in Deuteronomy. It was a productive land. Um, and when you add to that the, the description that we have, a beautiful description that we have in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 7, as Moses anticipates entering into the land, or his, his people entering into the land, uh, it's described as a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. So uh, a land of uh, great plenty, a land of rich abundance. So it does seem as if um, the promised land is being described as being like the Garden of Eden. And that, of course, is in fact a description that uh, is given to at least part of the Promised Land, uh, the Jordan Valley, uh, away back as far as uh, Genesis chapter 13 and verse 10, uh, where that part of the land is described as being like the Garden of the Lord. So we might think of the Promised Land as a kind of new Eden. Uh, it's also uh, a land of um, rest. Um, that's another element. Uh, you might, I'm going to pass over that, but uh, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on the land as a place of rest, both in the book of Deuteronomy and in Joshua itself. Uh, the final thing under this heading that I want us to note is that the, the land is uh, the inheritance of the firstborn son of God. So the land as Israel's inheritance, and that's a term that's uh, often used uh, with regard to Israel uh, coming into the land and possessing the land. We have it there in, uh, verse, uh, in chapter 1 and verse 6. Um, you will lead these people to inherit the land. And... Uh, Many, many times onwards, particularly from chapter 13 onwards, is it described as inheritance. And that uh, reminds us, of course, well, have you had an inheritance? Um, who gets the inheritance? It's the family who get the inheritance. Usually on the death of someone, we, we get an inheritance. Um, the children get the inheritance of... Uh, the family gets the inheritance. Well, uh, that's part of the background to this whole idea of the land being an inheritance. Uh, we remember from one of our previous studies in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22 onwards that uh, the Lord himself describes Israel as his firstborn son. He sent Moses with that message up to Pharaoh. Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go that he may worship me. Uh, so there's a reminder here uh, that this son is to enter into uh, the father's inheritance. The land of uh, the promised land, the land of Canaan, is in other points. I haven't noted it in any of the references, I think, but it's there in Joshua. Uh, it is um, the Lord's land uh, that they are to inherit as the family of God. So it looks very much that uh, what we have in the book of Joshua is the story of the Lord bringing his firstborn son Israel, uh, bringing his son home. Uh, great theme, of course, throughout the scriptures, isn't it? That's what God is about. He's about bringing his, his family home, bringing his children <coughs> home. Uh, he's bringing them into their home and into their inheritance in the land that looks as if it's being described as uh, like a new Eden. So he's bringing his family home into his new creation, as it were. 
And he does, he does that under the leadership of Joshua. Uh, Joshua is a Hebrew name, of course, Joshua. Um, in Greek, that's Jesus. Uh, so the book of Joshua in the Septuagint, in the Greek Bible, is Jesus. And Jesus, of course, is Jesus. Uh, so Joshua is Jesus. Well, it's the same name. But you can see the link under the leadership of Joshua, uh, under the leadership of, we might say, from a Greek point of view, Jesus, um, the Lord is bringing his people home uh, to enjoy their inheritance with him. Which explains uh, why um, this entrance into the promised land has often been uh, used as an illustration or type of the Christian's homecoming uh, to glory, to the closer presence of God. And of course we have the greater Joshua on, on Calvary, on the cross, uh, intimating that to uh, the dying thief, uh, when this greater Joshua, Jesus, uh, says to the dying thief, I'm taking you into paradise today. Today you will be in paradise. And the writer to the Hebrews uh, uses this story as well. In Hebrews 4 and 11, he encourages us to be like, uh, not the others, but to be like Joshua and Caleb. Uh, not like the rest of their generation who didn't enter into their rest. He says, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one might fall um, by following their example of disobedience. So the land is a very strong theme in the book of Joshua. Uh, a second theme that we'll look at uh, much more briefly is the theme of law or uh, covenant law. Since, as we saw in a, a previous week, the, the law is really at the very heart of the covenant and part of the, the covenant uh, relationship. Uh, and we see something of the importance of that law in the passage that we read from chapter 1. Uh, we can read it again, verses 7 and 8. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful uh, to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So, um, the Lord is saying to Joshua there that the law has to be his meditation uh, daily, day and night, constantly. Uh, it had to be, if you like, in his thoughts. Meditate upon it. Go over it and over it again and again in your mind, in your thoughts. Uh, but it wasn't just to be in his thoughts, it was actually to be in his mouth. Uh, and that would be as, uh, as he would mouth the words of the law, repeating the, the words of the law. As he meditated upon it, we tend to do a meditation up here. Uh, the ancient Hebrews tended to just to speak it out, murmur it under their breath uh, as, as they repeated the law and meditated upon the law. Uh, so it was to be not only in his minds but in his mouth. But I think in, in, uh, that also means that uh, he was to be teaching, he was to be instructing the people in the, in the word that not only filled his mind and his heart but actually filled his speech every day uh, and filled um, the directions that he gave to the people. So the law was to be in his thoughts uh, daily, it was to be in his mouth daily, but it was also to be in his legs daily and in his hands daily, in, in his walk, if you like, uh, as he practiced it. He was to obey the law, um, or the Hebrew literally at that point is, he was just to do it, do the law, do what God says. Um, and that, uh, the Lord says, and that alone is what would guarantee his 
success and the success of his people in the land. Uh, so the covenant people, um, not least its leadership, were to live under the law, uh, the law of the great king. And one of the differences, that's one of the differences between Israel. Israel was a theocracy. One of the differences between Israel and the other, the neighboring um, nations who had their own kings. In these nations, uh, it was the king. The king always made the law. Uh, but in all these neighboring nations, the king made the law. He didn't sit under the law himself. He did what he wanted to do. In Israel, it was the king who made the law, but the great king, God who's king, um, not David or anyone else, is on the throne. He's an under king, if you like, an under shepherd. Um, they live under the law of the great king. We saw in our list of the books of uh, the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 1 is the gateway into the prophetic literature, the prophetic section of Scripture, as far as the, uh, the, Hebrew, the Hebrews were concerned. So there's a very real sense in which uh, this passage in Joshua chapter 1 is not just for Joshua or for the people of his day, uh, it's for all of Israel in all its generations in the land of, of, of promise. And really, as I mentioned already, the, the whole of the rest of the history that you find in the books of the former prophets is an assessment of the extent to which Israel did that. Meditated on the law, spoke the law, did the law. Uh, and that was true for both the leaders, the kings, uh, the priests, the prophets, uh, and the ordinary people. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the third section of the Hebrew Bible, the writings, as we mentioned already, it begins with the book of Psalms. Do you know Psalm 1? Some of you will know Psalm 1 off by heart. That man hath perfect blessedness, he walketh not astray. The, the, the heart of that, verses 3 and 4, is about what? It's about the law. <coughs> How does this man come to be blessed? Well, he does what God asked Joshua to do. To have the law at the very heart of his being. His delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law he meditates day and night. Just like Joshua was supposed to do. And that's what makes him fruitful. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. So basically the same message as we have here in Joshua chapter 1. If Israel is going to prosper, if its leadership is going to prosper, if individual Israelites are going to prosper, they have to be soaked in the Torah, in the teaching of God in the scriptures, their lives have to be molded by the Torah, they have to do the Torah, they have to be practitioners of the word of God and the teaching of God. And it's no different with us, though we're in the new covenant, um, that's the way uh, we prosper as well uh, in the ways in which God wants us to prosper uh, and our families and our churches uh, it all depends on the place that we give to uh, the word of God to that. so it's interesting isn't it the three, the three sections of the, the Hebrew Bible the first is the Torah uh, which encapsulates really the, the central teaching of um, the covenant law ten commandments and then when you come to the second section it's clearly linked back to the Torah. Uh, this is the way you're to live. Uh, and when you come to the third section as well, again it's linked back to the Torah. So it's all based on the Torah. It's all on the teaching of uh, the Word of God in the Scriptures. Okay, uh, anything there from, from that? Um,
I mean, that's, that's a very basic kind of introduction to the book of Joshua. Um, but or some of the, the main themes of the, the book of Joshua. Peter, going back to um, the fulfillment of the promise, that um, all those under the Abrahamic and the um, what was it? The, well, anyway, under the Abrahamic covenant, um, that refers to them. Well, there are religions today who are, who are only under the Abrahamic covenant of our children of Abraham. How does it apply to them? They're not saved. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, in, in terms of so the questions about the Abrahamic covenant, and um, I suppose in one sense, who are um, the children of Abraham? Yes. Uh, it, the, I mean, Paul Paul uh, talks about this quite a lot in Galatians and, and Romans, and he makes it clear, uh, or he highlights for us what's already highlighted in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, that uh, that the promise actually doesn't. Come, uh, it doesn't apply to all the physical seed of Abraham. Um, so it applies, it's, it's through the line of Isaac, because Isaac is the son of promise. Uh, and then in the next generation, uh, it's, um, it's through the line of Jacob. Uh, that's that's the, 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 the son of promise. So the, there is a line, but it's the line of promise that's the important one. And that's the line of faith, and that's the line of spirit as um, Paul talks about it in, in, in Galatians um, and Romans uh, but if you, if, you, if you do look closely at, um, at Genesis uh, although Ishmael is not part of the line of promise uh, he is given blessings uh, the same is true of of, of others as well, of Esau. <coughs> so there is a recognition that they are connected to Abraham, but the line of promise actually comes through Isaac and through um, Jacob, who is Israel. But of course, in terms of the broad Abrahamic promise, the, 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 the promise of, to Abraham from the very beginning is that all the nations of the earth will be blessed in him. Uh, so that includes all the nations that have come from uh, Ishmael and all the nations that have come from Esau and so that's all the nations of the earth. So, uh, so there is ultimately no nation that's not embraced within the promise. I don't know if that helps. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, any other? So this, the people in Canaan were not blessed Oh, were they? Because they were all exterminated. Uh, well, no, they weren't all exterminated. Um, although, although, I mean, that is that is um, one of the difficult topics within Joshua and Judges. Um, they came. They were supposed to come under the harem, the ban. Uh, but right, right from the very beginning, you have. Uh, you, you have an awareness in, in, um, with, with, with the salvation of Rahab in chapter 2. Uh, now, Rahab was not physically uh, of the seed of Abraham, but in terms of faith, she became part of the seed of Abraham and is embraced. So she, uh, at the very outset of the book of Joshua, which is, has uh, quite an emphasis on... Um, the fact that uh, idolatry has to be destroyed and so on. Um, Rahab stands there as an example and she must have been one of probably many who, because she embraced the God of Israel in that sense, became part of the covenant people of God and, and therefore um, um, part of the, of the promise. And of course, doesn't she end up in genealogy of Jesus and so on because of that so so yeah um, 
Yeah, that, I mean that that whole thing of the the harem and and what's happening, you know, would take another uh, study there uh, to go into that um, uh, fully. Part of it is that uh, mentioned in Genesis 15 that uh, the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full, uh, so the patience of God for another 400 years waiting. Um, for that uh, to be the case, uh, and it, it's 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 all about the land is to be the holy land, and the battle for Israel was always uh, the battle f between uh, the living God and all the other gods round about them, and it's a battle that they lost again and again and again. They went the way of the Canaanites, uh, so. Something of what we're seeing in Joshua and Judges has to do with, with that. Um, the depth of the destructiveness and evil of idolatry. Um, I, I think we don't really understand the, the horrible nature of sin properly. Um, and that's part of our problem when we uh, um, look at, at these sections. But that, that's, it's, it's for another day, but, but certainly Rahab is there, um, and Rahab's not, not, not the only one, of course, she's mentioned in, in, in Joshua. Okay, let's uh, uh, go on to the, the book of Judges. Um, and what we see in the book of Judges is, first of all, breathtaking decline. Um, not least against the background of a verse we've already read, uh, the, uh, uh, verse 31 of uh, the last chapter of Joshua. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived them and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Um, and it's against that background that uh, we, we get into uh, the book of Judges. And again, the, the way I want to, uh, to come at this is by just comparing and contrasting uh, the beginning of Judges with the end of Judges. Uh, so you read there at the beginning of Judges, just the opening verses. Uh, after the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who will be the first to go up and fight for us against the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah is to go. I have given the land into their hands, and so on. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, um, Joshua is now passed on. Uh, others are leading the people of God. Um, but what do the covenant people of God do? Uh, they, they immediately, they seek the Lord. They want to know the Lord's mind and the Lord's will uh, and the Lord's way forward for them. Um, by the time you come to the, the end of the book of Judges, what you have is the polar opposite of that. Um, the final verse of Judges, um, verse 25 of chapter 21. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. Um, everyone lived by his own light, by his own inner light. So at the beginning of Judges, you've got a, a people who are inquiring of God, what's the way ahead? Show us the way ahead. Give us your light on the way ahead. By the end of the book of Judges, you've got a people uh, who aren't inquiring of God at all, um, uh, who are living by their own light, the light of their own understanding, if you like. Uh, and the final chapters, if you read the final dark chapters of, uh, of the book of uh, Judges, you'll see something of the tragic story of Israel at the time there. Uh, judges, uh, chapters that are full of gross idolatry, chapters 17 and 18, um, 
So Micah goes and he uh, gets all of these idols himself. He sets up his own shrine. He, he nobles someone to be his priest. And in the next chapter, um, uh, Danites come along and they say, oh, that's quite good. We'll nick all of this stuff and we'll nick the priest as well and we'll set him up as our priest. So that's one of the tribes of Israel and uh, they're acting like that. Uh, so gross uh, idolatry. In the following chapters, you've got in chapter 19, you've got gross immorality, um, some indications of um, homosexual activity, but uh, also gang rape. I mean, it's very dark morally uh, in chap chapter 19. And then in the closing two chapters, you've got um, uh, deep divisions among the tribes, great loss of life. Um, the covenant people are fighting with one another and spilling uh, one another's blood. It's a bit like the church nowadays sometimes, <laughs> factions and all of that. Um, so the, 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 but the contrast between the beginning and the ending of the book couldn't be more stark. That's why it's often called the dark days of the judges. Oh, um, so a, a period of desperate decline, if we had time, uh, we would see that it, it's, uh, in some places it's uh, shown to be political decline, it's shown to be military decline, uh, but in particular it's spiritual um, decline and moral decline in Israel. And of course, these two things are so closely linked together, you, the one goes with the other. Um, they go hand in hand, every bit as much as the, the two tables of the law go hand in hand. Uh, that is the table that has to do with uh, our relationship with God, so the vertical level. Um, uh, and then following on that, that is the horizontal level, our relationships with, with one another how we behave with one another. If you get the first part wrong, there's no way you can get the second part right. If the first collapses, then the second collapses. And we're seeing that in our own country today. We're seeing that in the whole of Western society today. You throw away the first table of the law uh, and you cannot sustain, even if you would want to sustain, the relationships, the right relationships that are there in the, in the second uh, table of the law. And uh, this decline throughout the period of the judges, it's evident in the, in the description even of the leaders that are chosen by God and raised up by God to be, uh, to be judges uh, and saviors of Israel. And uh, again, one of the real ways to, uh, to, to highlight that is by, by looking at the first judge, Othniel, chapter 3, verses 7 to 10, and comparing him with, uh, with Samson. Now, Othniel is described for us really in terms that uh, suggest that he's the perfect judge. Uh, there's no indication of any sin, any wrongdoing in his life. Uh, he's one of those characters, a bit like Joshua, uh, who, who um, seems to be almost, we know they were sinners, of course, but in the description that's given of them, the unblemished in his leadership. Contrast that with the last of the judges described in chapters 13 to 16, uh, Samson. Uh, and, well, we know Sa uh, Samson, sexually dissolute um, leader amongst God's people. And despite the fact that the Spirit of God comes on him something like four times, uh, he's unable to do what Othniel and some of the earlier judges were able to do. He's unable to deliver Israel. He's unable to save Israel. Uh, so that's part of the, uh, the decay that we, see, that we see there. So it's a period of breathtaking decline. Uh, and the second thing that, that I want to highlight is uh, just the, the pattern that's set for us in chapter 2, uh, chapter, uh, verses 11 to 19 of Judges. Uh, and, and what we're given here is a summary of the way the whole of the history of the period of the judges turned out. And um, there are a number of elements uh, that we read uh, in these verses 
that you see repeated again and again through the stories from chapter 3 on uh, to chapter 16. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a good exercise for us to, uh, as we go through these stories, to look out for uh, these main elements of the, of the repeating pattern uh, that we find here. So let's, let's read it. First of all, uh, Judges 2, verse 11. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. Uh, they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples round about them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves and to, to other gods and worshipped them. And like their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked the way of obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was the judge uh, and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and worshipping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. So there's three or four elements there um, that <coughs> are repeated again and again uh, throughout the, the, the stories of the judges. The first of these uh, that we see in verses 11 to 13 is that Israel is indicted for its uh, apostasy, uh, its idolatry, its turning away uh, from the Lord. Turning away from the Lord and turning instead towards uh, other gods, the gods of the people round about them. So that was the problem of uh, the Canaanites um, around them with their worship. Uh, so in that, of course, they broke the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And, uh, I mean, the, the whole list of verbs that we have there from verse 11 uh, to 13 highlights just how, how, how deep the apostasy was. So that's the first thing. Again and again, Israel turned away from the Lord and turned to idol worship. Then you have God. The second thing is, how does God respond to that? Well, well God is, is angry with that. Uh, they are his covenant people. They're supposed to be his sheep, his servants, his son, his, his children, his bride. Uh, so he's jealous for his bride that she's chasing some other, uh, some other gods. Uh, so he's angry with them. And what he does is, is he hands them over to the power of an oppressor. Uh, so verses 14 and 15. They're no longer able to resist those who attack them. And what we have here is something we've seen again and again. It's, uh, uh, it's judgment is a reversal of blessing. So what's happening is a, a, a partial reversal of the exodus and the conquest. In the conquest, God had given them the land. Uh, they had been freed from Pharaoh's uh, oppression. They were given the land. They enjoyed the land. Uh, they're still in the land, of course, in the book of Judges, uh, but they've lost their liberty, and they've lost control of the land. The land is not in their power uh, under the judgment of God. Uh, and then the third stage, uh, verses 16 to 19, and this comes out of the, the compassion and mercy of God, and only out of the compassion and mercy of God, verses 16 to 19, God, after a time, he raises up a judge for them to be their leader. And uh, the main function of the judge, you'll see in verse 16, 
second part of verse 16 is to see the, the function of the judges throughout the book of Judges was salvation. It wasn't to sit in a courtroom and decide, well, uh, you get three months for this and you get uh, this and that and the next. And that's not the judging. That's, uh, it's judging. Uh, the, judges, the, the judging that the judges did was, was largely bring salvation to God's people, bring deliverance to God's people. In other words, they reverse the judgment and bring the people back into the experience of the exodus and of the conquest of the land, possession of the land. Uh, and that's made possible by the Lord's presence with the judge. And if you read through uh, the stories of uh, individual judges, you'll see uh, the important place uh, that the, uh, the coming of the Spirit of God had in the lives of uh, the judges. And it, uh, I've given you, I think, some references to that that you can look up uh, afterwards. And uh, throughout the lifetime then of the, the judges that had been raised up by God, uh, Israel uh, was free from oppression and free to enjoy the blessings of the promised land. So these are, these are the, the three main elements. The idolatry and apostasy, the anger of God, the chastisement and judgment of God, so that they're handed over to people, to others, to oppress them. And then, after a while, God, in compassion, releases them from that. It's not that they've changed. It's not that they've been come good or righteous or anything else. He just has compassion upon his people and he changes their circumstances and they begin to experience the fullness of blessing uh, again and do that for the lifetime of of the judge and then it all circle happens again verse 19 when the judge dies the nation slips back into its old ways in fact it gets even worse um, so what you have is each generation goes further down than the previous generation. So you have the same kind of spiral downwards that we saw in Genesis 1, Genesis 3 to 11. And Israel's only hope is the Lord's saving mercy. Okay, anything there? link and relationship do you see between the Judges 2 that we've looked at and Judges 1 where when they took over the land they did not do what they were expected to do from verse 27 on they did not drive out the people they did not drive them out completely etc yeah um um, that is, that is the same kind of declension that you see throughout the book is actually seen in, in chapter 1 as well. Um, and um, the story kind of changes about halfway through the chapter and it has to do with that, that, that very point that, uh, um, that they don't uh, drive out the Canaanites. They, um, and they, they begin, if you like, to be become syncretistic then. Uh, and as uh, the worship goes on alongside them, they begin to embrace more of the bits and pieces of the worship into their worship. And in the end of the day, they become Canaanites. But they're still called Israelites, but effectively, they're just uh, Canaanites. Which is why um, when you come when you, when you come to the end of the former prophets, the end of uh, Second Kings, they're driven out of the land. What is God doing there? Well, in one sense, he's, he's reversing uh, the exodus and the conquest of the land. Uh, but in another sense, he's just, he's no respecter of persons and he's recognizing that, that his people have become Canaanites. So they're driven out from the land as the Canaanites were supposed to be driven out from the holy land. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, there's there's lots more in the book of Judges that we could. Yeah. Does that mean then that Joshua never caused the completeness that was intended or expected? Uh, well, you, uh, you get you get indications of that even in the book of Joshua itself. Uh, though there are there are verses in Joshua that. Um, that, that highlight the fact that, that Joshua took all of the land. Um, it's, um, you have to uh, think of that in terms of broad brush strokes, if you like. Uh, so yes, they took the central area, they took the north, they took the south. But in each of these areas, the tribes, if you like, had, had to press into their territory further and further um, as, as the years went, went by. And, and there are some indications of that in, in the book of uh, Joshua itself, just a couple of verses here and there. Um, yeah. um, there's, a, there's two mentions of the death of Joshua here in the two initial chapters. It's at the beginning of chapter one, and then it comes, the death of Joshua is mentioned again in chapter six. So it looks as if things are not chronologically written down. Absolutely, yeah. The scriptures are, well, in, in broad brush strokes, they are chronological, um, but um, the scriptures are often ordered in terms of <coughs> themes as well as in terms of <coughs> chronology. Um, and uh, you get that, I think we've indicated that from, from the very beginning. You get that from Genesis 1 and Genesis mm. 2. Genesis 2 verse 4 doesn't happen on the eighth day yeah. or whatever. Genesis 2 takes you back into somewhere in the creation week and um, fills out the story from another perspective. So, so sometimes, yes, you have, you're following um, cr chronologically on, um, but that's only part of, uh, part of it. Uh, sometimes it's themes that are highlighted uh, and the way that they're highlighted is the way they're juxtaposed with put side by side with, with other things and other stories and so on. Okay. Um, right. I um, want to say a, a little bit just in closing about uh, an overview of the, of, of the former prophets. And I've kind of alluded to that already. Uh, again, uh, I've been talking about one of the ways of uh, how you get the main theme or one of the main themes or some of the main themes of a passage or a, or a book is uh, con comparing and contrasting the beginning and the end. We've done that with Joshua. We've done it with uh, uh, Judges. But you can actually do the same with uh, the whole of the former prophets. So compare the opening chapters of Joshua with the closing chapters of uh, Second Kings. Uh, the opening chapters of Joshua, they're on the verge of the promised land, they're ready to press into the promised land, they go into the promised land, they take the promised land, um, God put, puts them in the promised land. When you come to the end of the book of uh, Second Kings, they're removed from the promised land. They're off into exile. There are conquered people, a subjected people, uh, so, the whole story from Joshua through to Second People could be described as in and out of the Promised Land. That's what it's about. Uh, paradise gained and paradise lost. And in many ways, it's just a repetition of Genesis 2 and 3. I think I mentioned that, that already. Genesis 2 and verse 7, when... Uh, God created Adam in the first place. He's the son of God, made in the image of God, and the likeness of God. He's created outside the garden. Verse 8, repeated again in verse 15 of Genesis 2, God takes his son and places him in uh, his garden paradise. He brings him to rest, the Hebrew word, uh, in his garden paradise. By the end of Genesis 3, he's driven out. He's exiled from the garden. So in the story of, uh, uh, that you have uh, from Exodus onwards, uh, you, have, uh, you have Israel, the firstborn son of God, uh, God's new humanity, 
Um, so you've got the Son of God. So God takes his Son, uh, enters into a covenant relationship with his Son at Mount Sinai. Uh, he brings him into what we've described earlier on as what looks like the new Eden of the Promised Land. And then uh, what you find, for example, in Hosea chapter 9 and verse 15, uh, the same word is used of Israel being driven out from the promised land as is used of Adam being driven out from, from paradise. And driven out for the same reason, disobedience. Um, <coughs> so you have that kind of repeating pattern and there's a sense I suppose in which um, we could say well what assurance have we that we will not be driven out I'm no different from Adam no. Uh, we're no different from Israel uh, the sins that were there in Adam are still there with us the sins that we see in Israel amongst the covenant people of God we, we still see uh, amongst ourselves uh, so should we then live um, in fear that we will be somehow miss out on paradise, driven out, lose our salvation. Well, the answer would be yes, apart from Jesus, uh, because Jesus is Adam. He's, Jesus is the last Adam. Jesus is uh, the perfect man. Jesus is the true Israel of God. Uh, Jesus, of course, was obedient uh, in a way that Adam and Israel were not obedient. Um, he was obedient unto death, even the death of uh, the cross. Uh, so he is the faithful son of the Father. He's, he's the faithful servant of the great king. He's the obedient lamb, the shepherd. Um, so we would expect that Eden would be his forever. Paradise is his. Can't be otherwise. Um, you'll live long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. If you're obedient. So paradise is where the last Adam uh, belongs. Is where the true servant Israel uh, of God uh, belongs. But of course what we find in Jesus' experience is the very opposite. Uh, so he ends his life here on earth, at least as far as his body is concerned, outside. So he dies outside the city wall, the gates of Jerusalem. He's uh, outside the city of God. He's, uh, he dies as one who is excommunicated from the community, from the covenant communities, exiled from that people. He's cast out on the garbage heap of Calvary. But of course, even worse than that, he's actually exiled from the presence of God. More than Adam ever was at the end of Genesis 3, more than Israel ever was uh, at the time of the exile. And uh, you read the gospel stories and you see that he has lost all sense of his uh, status as a son of God, as the son of God. But for the first time in his life, he can no longer pray, my my. The Father, Abba, Father. Um, he still prays, but it's my God, my God. So he has lost that consciousness of his status of, of sonship. Uh, he is the lamb, and the lamb on the cross doesn't see the shepherd. He has a shepherd, he's the lamb, so he has a shepherd. He has a good shepherd, the great shepherd, but he's not aware of the presence of the of the shepherd, of his tender care, of his love. Uh, there seems, as this true servant of God on the cross, there seems to be no protection from his great king. Uh, and in a sense, that's the gospel. At least it's, for us, it's the gospel. Uh, because that was his experience taking our place. He was there for you. He was there for me. He had no need to be there for himself. 
Adam was driven from the garden as a result of his own sin and disobedience. Israel was driven into exile because of its own idolatry and unfaithfulness and disobedience. But this man, the last Adam, the true servant of Israel of God, he's driven out from the presence of God because he was carrying my sin. And my disobedience, and my apostasy, and my idolatry, and my unfaithfulness. And because of that, uh, he does for me and for you what he did for the thief on the cross that day. He brings us into paradise. Assured. Because he's been outside for us already. Father, we bless you that uh, the cross is the place of the resolution of the whole mystery of sin. We thank you, Father, that in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, you have taken all of our sin and all of the sin of your covenant people from all nations and all generations upon yourself in Jesus Christ, your Lamb, from whom was hidden your face as he died in our place. Help us to see that. And help us to know uh, that because of that, paradise is open for us. Paradise is our home to which you have brought us already in Christ, to which you will bring us closer to yourself at our death and ultimately to which you will bring all of your covenant people at last in the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness alone dwells. Thank you, Father, for all that you have given to us <coughs> and done for us in and through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Help us to live the rest of our lives, the rest of our days, for him, for you. In his name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Thank you.